I'm, I'm really thrilled uh, for being here and I'm very happy to see uh, many familiar faces, but also some new faces. And here we go. Uh, so uh, this was, this is not exactly the title of my dissertation, but I think it gives a general picture of uh, like what was that about. So, uh -huh. So I explored um, tourism consumption of biodiversity, and particularly I focused on thatch huts, palapas in Mexico, and its relationship uh, with uh, tropical forest management. And let me see if I can. Maybe no. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. So for today, uh, I will I will talk about. Uh, what I thought I was going to answer initially, <laughs> and what I actually did. It's very different, as you will see. And so I will talk like a broad ex uh, overview of what I explored in the dissertation, but I will focus only on one of the chapters um, to make it like more, I don't know, just to be able to explore more the details. And uh, yeah, so I thought that I was going to, step one, find an understudied tropical forest product in the Yucatan Peninsula. I, I thought, oh yeah, I got pollen, that was easy. Then I thought that I will be able to design a simple subcultural experiment, and then with that will inform best management practices in is community managed forest. That sound like why not? Yes, and and of course then I will wrap it. <laughs> <laughs> but of course it wasn't that easy. So um, uh, first, just a, a quick explanation on how with this understudied uh, tropical forest product that I thought that I was focused only in that one. So these are small diameter trees of various species that are harvested in these uh, natural forested managed by local communities. And they are largely used for building these fancy, nice batch huts in the tourist destinations in the northern coast of the state of Quintana Roo in the Yucatan Peninsula. So here you can see a really big and nice batch hut. And here you can see where these poles come from. And so after some initial um, field trips to the region, I uh, realized that I need to take two steps backward. And so I asked first, oh, does anyone know what polewood species are actually being harvested in the forest? And they had some idea, but with many doubts and many questions. And also I, I wanted to ask, does anyone know how actually they're harvesting them? And um, there, they, there, there were some ideas about it, but not many certainties. And also, um, how does that management decisions were made? And it was the same. So I decided that before proposing anything, I, I would like to better understand what it was going on there. So, Initially, like my first realization that later on uh, led me my my dissertation and um, my objectives were that other forest products older than this pole these small trees were harvested for the same market, and I should understand um, better uh, the role of tourism as a driver of these uh, forest management. And um, I realized also that it was really difficult to generalize how these communities were managing these forest products. So just to make uh, a simple civil cultural experiment design will be made, maybe, maybe will help just a couple of communities, but all the rest will be a different story. So, so this is, uh, <laughs> so this was what I actually tried to answer with my three uh, like largest chapters. And so one was 
what pollen species are more vulnerable and but also in what context are these species more vulnerable and also how tourism uh, influence uh, forest management in this particular region and also I was curious to explore how um, tourism is globally fueling um, the use of biodiversity and for that I use thatch hut construction as a case study of a larger um, thing. So today's talk will be about the second question, um, how tourism has influenced um, tropical forest management in this region of Mexico. And so just to give you like some context, tourism um, represents about like 10% of the global GDP. So you can expect that it can have all sorts of impacts on whatever you can think of. And so commonly, um, if you read the tourism literature, you will see like, um, like a list of positive and negative impacts. So, so the clear example is just this destruction of mangroves and um, habitat in general by tourism development. But also as negative impacts, it's uh, often mentioned the introduction of exotic uh, species, emissions, of course, carbon emissions from air travel, and increased vulnerability of what is around and in the attractions, tourism attractions, like the sites, and also vulnerability to specific species. Um, and also, there is some literature and the tourism realm that um, evaluates the impact of consumptive tourism on biodiversity, in particular how um, hunting and fishing tourism may um, or may not impact, be impacted by, um, by this type of tourism. So, and on the other side, tourism literature highlights some positive or potentially positive impacts of tourism on biodiversity. And first of all, uh, tourism is seen as a market-based conservation strategy, particularly, of course, ecotourism. And that can help to gain political economic support for conservation in general. Sometimes it's used uh, as a justification for establishing new protected areas or to fund existing ones. And also it's seen as an alternative um, option to more um, destructive development um, initiatives. It's also seen as an opportunity for environmental education and to improve management practices in general, natural resources in general. And also a more contested issue is on the role of tourism in reducing the dependency of local communities on the by biodiversity. And from the side of the environmental sciences, um, much of the research has been done on how these um, natural resources are managed. That sometimes, of course, they acknowledge that are being sold to tourism, but the linkages between this demand from tourism and, um, and actual management has been uh, poorly, I don't know, poorly, but not sufficiently documented. And so we can see examples uh, in handcrafts like wood carvings and so on, uh, different kind of souvenirs, including butterflies, all kind of seashells and all that. Um, construction materials, there's some uh, um, previous re research done on that. And, um, also increased consumption of game meat or seafood that target specifically um, tourism market. <laughs> so focusing on our question in this region, how has tourism influenced forest management? So um, first, just an overview of what uh, have been the main ideas on this forest product destruction dynamics. So like a typical our conception is that we have an increased de demand that often can lead to forest product depletion. And one option will be um, just management intensification, usually through cultivation. So we can be 
that can be agroforestry systems and reach fallows and so on. And so, but there are other options after these forest products have been depleted, right? So it can be substituted or just expand to new areas. But also, uh, there are some other options that those are like the classic ones, but uh, also just the resource can be really, really resilient. For example, that may be the case of some grasses. And also governance can be improved, and, but also the demand can decline. And so the resource can be uh, recovered after some time. And so just focusing on, on the region that I study, uh, this is the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. And I work uh, mostly in the state of Quintana Roo, that is, uh, the eastern portion where you have the nicest beaches, the Caribbean. And I work um, in the um, municipality of Felipe Carrillo Puerto, that is in the uh, central portion of the state, and also along the northern tourism corridor between Cancun and Tulum and all the Mayan Riviera. And as you may know, this region. Uh, really have a long history of human occupation, um, at least more than uh, 3,000 years uh, with continuous Mayan presence. And so we can he see amazing things like this, but also the Mayans are still around and they use um, this kind of forest products for their houses. And, uh, but now we see batch huts also in this context where you have really big um, thatch huts and different structures that use these kind of uh, forest-based materials. And the size of, the, of this demand is really, really big. Only talking about hotels, now there are uh, near 1,000 hotels, uh, near 100,000 hotel rooms. But if you add up like restaurants, clubs, and so on, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the size, but it's really big. So talking about forest management in this region. So this forest uh, lies between tropical moist and tropical dry uh, life zones. And um, so it depends if you have better soils, the, the trees uh, tend to be taller, but there are areas with really poor rocky soils and they are pretty short. So, <coughs> and these forests are communally owned in the form of a helos. And uh, the thing is that mm, before the 1980s, these uh, communities have the land tenure, but not the rights to harvest the timber in their community land holdings. So actually some parastatal and uh, private concessions were harvesting the timber. So as you may imagine, the forests are uh, pretty high graded. And, uh, but finally, at, at mid 1980s, the communities got those rights. And so they have like more than three decades of experience of managing their own forest. And these ahitos range between 1,000 hectares to uh, 100,000 hectares. So you can uh, imagine that there's a huge uh, heterogeneity among those, right? And the initial focus of forest management in the region uh, was chicle tapping, that is um, the resin of the Manilcara sapota tree that is or was used for making chewing gum. The original organic chewing gum is made from this tree. And also, of course, uh, precious timbers, including mahogany and Spanish cedar. So um, in this chapter, I explore the role of tourism uh, in forest product emergence and evolution, also uh, evolution of governance, changes in demand, and the, in, and the influence of all these factors on landscape management in the state. So here we have a very fancy hotel with a fancy thatch hut. So he, here um, we can see like the three, um, forest products that I focus on. So uh, thatching materials, pole wick, that are these small poles that you can see in the, in the roof, in this structure. 
and supported posts uh, that are like big blogs that came from this tree that was used to make these chewing gums, you know, organic chewing gums that I mentioned. So uh, for getting evidence to really inform uh, this uh, story, I use different sources of evidence, including just going with the harvesters for several, several times with a group of local students from uh, intercultural uh, Mayan University in the region. And so we were, sometimes we were like eight of us taking notes and running after the paliceros to take notes of, and taking uh, specimens and, and every piece of information that we were able to gather with them. And, um, and so we do that, we've made that um, for pollwood and to a lesser extent for batching grass. And also we analyzed uh, different archives, including um, the National um, Ministry of Environment archives in the local branch of that and uh, local forest management um, documents of any sort, and also information about hotel, hotel construction in the region. So uh, these archives span uh, around a 30 year span. And another source of information that was also very interesting was just to explore what was being used on the beachfront resorts. So we walk long stretches along the beach, just taking notes on what forest product uh, was used in 75 hotels. We interviewed a bunch of people, including forest technicians, local and federal authorities, harvesters, contractors, and everyone that want to tell us their story. And so we identify uh, like some events or some um, drivers that really change what, how these forest products have been managed um, during this time. And one of that was really salient was hurricanes, and particularly some hurricanes impact the, directly the forest communities, and other uh, hurricanes impact the coastal areas. So that that's a huge difference because one really impacts the demand and the other one the supply and I, I, I think I won't uh, really go to all the details but it was really interesting how these two really change um, in positive and negative ways how um, forest management has been done so at least we identified like three really important hurricanes um, for example uh, hurricane Gilbert impact the northern coast, uh, like the coast, like the um, tourist areas. These two, Emily and Vilma, also the tourist areas, and you can see the major um, forestry hills. And at the same time, we identify different um, development or tourism development initiatives that were launched uh, during these years, and how that relates with changes in forest product management for these three forest products. And I will go with, the, um, after that I will go with the details of that. And also what we see is that here, this is the number of hotel rooms, so you can see just a steadily increase, but you can see peaks of like boom in the construction sector. So for example, here 1996, was when the Riviera Maya project was launched. And you can see a spike that single year, more than uh, 7,000 hotel rooms were constructed. So you can see that the demand and then forest management is not by any means linear. And also um, uh, new regulations were really important uh, game changers on how uh, forests and landscapes in general has been uh, managed throughout these years. One very important piece that uh, has been reported in other places too is how uh, agricultural areas and forest areas are defined in the forest and environmental codes. And um, 
also, of course, um, like the definition of endangered species that limits the, their use for some of these purposes. And here we can see the differences between these uh, destinations where we focused our collection of um, forest product use. So one is Tulum, Playa del Carmen, and Cancun. Tulum, as you can see here, this is like a representative uh, example of a uh, small eco chic uh, boutique hotel in Tulum. They are like small size hotels, but many of them that uh, make a really intensive use of uh, forest products. Uh, in Playa del Carmen, they are really, really big uh, hotels. And they still use uh, a good amount of forest products, but less intensely per, per guest, if you wish. And uh, in the case of Cancun, it's also you have these really massive hotels, but with a lower use of forest products. And so now talking about these specific forest products, we see a shift. So traditional Mayan houses in this region largely used um, palm thatch, sabal species. And we, what we have seen in, in these commercial uses along the coast is that they initially they also used palm species, but now they completely, almost <coughs> completely shift to grass thatching. And uh, so that represents um, not only a change in the plants that they are harvesting, but also the region that are supplying that forest product. I mean, this, I, mean, I don't know if this is a forest product, maybe it's actually a more agricultural product, if you will. But the thing is that um, it, it has changed a lot and it's, it's not nothing that it's very apparent, but but if you put attention, it's very evident. So uh, the thing is that um, they, there have been changes in these uh, regulations that regulate agriculture and forest. And the thing is that uh, now um, you have to, to make like a small forest management plan for harvesting those palms, even if sometimes they also grow in open areas, because that's considered a forest product. And this is, this is considered an agricultural product. So you don't need any permit for doing that. And the uh, funny part is that it was like some years ago, this grass was considered an invasive and uh, campesinos were really pissed off when they got that grass <laughs> in their lands. And now they're making business and sometimes even cultivating, uh, putting herbicide, putting uh, fertilizer and so on. And so, uh, two really important factors uh, foster this change. One is, of course, these regulations, but also so, uh, uh, aesthetic preferences by customers. And, um, and the other forest product, it's pollen. Uh, these are small trees. Uh, uh, what was interesting it was that previously it was reported that pollen include more or less 30 species and we found that they harvest more than 90. So it's really, I mean, they harvest most of the cheese species in the forest. However, of course, they have some preferences and that, that's important too. And, but there has been some <coughs> changes in pollen because initially it wasn't regulated and then it has been increasingly regulated. And now um, they, the both the government but also local communities are trying to to avoid harvesting their prime timber species as pollwood in order to maintain their recruitment and uh, and also I know the same problem the regulation for of agricultural areas have been inhibiting um, the use of um, small pollwood. Uh, being harvested from uh, agricultural fallows. And so sometimes that means that in, in some cases they will burn anyways those fallows and in some cases sometimes they harvest these small trees from the fallows, but 
but they are exposed of being fined or jailed, whatever. And uh, our last product is these uh, sapote that are now being used for post mostly. So we can see um, evolution, but not a perfect evolution, but um, from these three used mainly as a non-timber forest product where they uh, use the resin. Then um, some time that um, this um, species was used and is in a small diameter, uh, trees and poleweed, and also timber um, as bigger size logs. And the thing is that now increasingly, they are in some ajitos, there are very few ajitos that are still harvesting um, the resin, the actual And those ajitos, some of them tend to only focus on the non-timber forest produce, some of them do both, and some of them, and many of them, have completely focused just on the timber side. And one factor of change, of course, like the main factor of change is the decline in the demand of the non-timber forest product, but also the impact of hurricane Dean um, really um, damaged many of these trees. So that was a good justification to, to log the damaged trees. But the thing is that now you have a demand for those species. So now it's just, they continue logging the species. So like main take home messages. Uh, so as we um, realized, some modification is by no means a linear process. Um, for this case, we, uh, we witnessed that the man have at least three dimensions. One is like the new construction for new developments, uh, reconstruction after hurricanes, and also to a lesser extent maintenance. And so we can identify like soul trends uh, versus rapid shocks. And we can see here with this nice pink <laughs> uh, wow. painted grass patch. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we can see that subsistence thatch huts are really different uh, compared to commercial thatch huts. So a different new aesthetics is driving uh, how these uh, thatch huts are built. Not uh, authenticity is not important apparently. Mm -hmm. And so um, new social and economic values are transforming uh, resource use. And so that implies that uh, trees of different sizes are now being harvested, different species and different mat materials in general. And of course, tourism have a different budget, we can see here. And um, so one uh, example of these changes uh, can be seen in several states of Mexico, but also in other places like in Fiji, for example, where they are harvesting a strangler figs for, uh, for post, really fancy high-end post in these kind of constructions. And so as open questions, we, uh, can we make predictions with this complexity? I don't know. And how to manage uh, biodiversity, how to make forest management plans, in these changing environments, markets, and cultures. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. And do you have questions? <laughs> and I want to thank um, to a, a lot of people, but especially to parents. And uh, I'm, I have been very happy to, to be a student here. Thank you. <laughs>